God's always going to be saved. I want to know if you noticed, <clears throat> but the world is insane, yeah. if there's any doubt. Uh, and, uh, and your country is as bad as mine, or maybe worse, worse. <laughs> but um, uh, sometimes the stuff that's going on in our countries uh, is so uh, distracting. All the stuff is so bad, so distracting, that we forget it's good to be saved. Okay? Uh, it is good to be back. It's good to be back. Um, your pastor's moving Friday. He needs help. That's why we're leaving Wednesday. <laughs> but um, we have, uh, this, this is the first we have been uh, out of our country since uh, COVID. Uh, first week of March, I was preaching in 2020, I was preaching in Texas. And um, that was when COVID broke out. I, I flew in on Saturday and Sunday morning, I got, uh, I got breakfast there at the hotel. And then Monday morning, by Monday morning, there was no more breakfast. And then by Tuesday morning, you had to have a mask. And by Wednesday morning, my entire schedule had canceled all the way to October. If you heard about all those small businesses that got shut down over COVID, I'm one of them. Thankfully, I had a piece of cardboard and a black magic marker. We made it through. <laughs> uh, a lot of interstates in the United States. So we, uh, in fact, we did better. I may, I may go back to that. But um, I went, and, and now here, let me tell you about the book table. I, you, I'm not going to mention it. I'll mention some about it tonight. Uh, I want to explain why we have a book table. Some folks don't, don't understand, but <clears throat> we only have a book table for one reason. We are desperate. <laughs> All right? uh, so you, you don't have to go back there and buy anything. You can feel free just to go buy and leave money. Um, <laughs> your pastor said that uh, if you wanted to give to us to, to put our name in it, uh, and I just want to say for whoever's counting, uh, you know, I don't want any of your money. You don't, I know you don't want any of mine. But sometimes people do spell gip in Greek. T-I-T-H-E. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to get what's mine. <laughs> All right, it is, uh, it is always good to be safe. We love the Newmans. We really do. Uh, to get that come up here uh, is so good. We always look forward to them. They pray a lot for us. That's why I'm here. It really is. And so uh, we are very thankful. Uh, good to see all you folks again. I know you didn't know I was going to be here. That's how you came. But um, uh, it is good. Well, we'll talk to you. Why don't you open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm not preaching out of that. I just want to see if it's in your version. And, you know, um, we are all Bible believers. And sometimes Bible believers think they know the whole Bible. Uh, and I don't really claim that. Uh, but remember this about Revelation. I don't care what you believe about Revelation. Nothing in Revelation has taken place yet. Nothing. So, well, I got this. Well, you can think what you want. Uh, and it starts out this way, verse 1. It says, Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he, shall, uh, and he, and he sent and signified it by his angel uh, unto his servant John. Let's bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father, it is good to be saved. It really is. And Lord God, um, you know, you, you blessed us all, putting us in good countries. These are good countries, Canada, the United States. To, you, you let us have a good way of life, and we all praise you for it. But God, help us not to get so caught up uh, with everything that's going on in this world that we forget that it's always just good to be saved. So we thank you, God, for your kindness and your goodness. Ask you now, Father, uh, to be in this service, Father. These people here, they came here for two reasons. They want something from you, uh, and they want something from your book. And I am the main obstacle to that. So I'm asking you, God, to get Gip out of their way, out of your way, and speak to the hearts of your people, God, and accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Um, i gotta, I got to tell you this. I just uh, offhanded. I, I had a surgery on my vocal cords in 2021, and it didn't come out like they thought it would. I can still talk. Um, but, uh, but, yeah. Yeah, my wife got me this guy. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how that happened. But uh, uh, because of that, I end up eating these a lot uh, just to keep it all working. So if you see that, uh, they're just the little compressed uh, CBD. It gets exciting toward the end of the sermon. It really does after I take about four of those. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you this morning about predestination. Okay. Now, I am not a Calvinist. When I say, you know, you say predestination, that's what everybody thinks. Well, you must be a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. Uh, and the reason I'm not a Calvinist is very simple. I was predestined not to be a Calvinist. I, <laughs> I tried to be a Calvinist once. I really did. And I found not being one was irresistible. So I, I did become a Calvinist. 
But what I mean by predestination uh, is simply this. Um, there are some things that are going to happen, and nobody can stop it. Uh, I think you guys remember, like I said, with COVID. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the greatest power in the world, and everybody can, can possess this power. This is no magic. The greatest power in the world is the power of no. Just say no. Somebody asks you to do a favor. No. No. And uh, down, in, down in our country, oh, probably 20, 25 years ago, there was, a, there was an, in, let's just figure this was the border of an Indian reservation, uh, and all the people are up in here, and they were going to put a highway through here, and rather than have to go through a mountain or, or anything like that, uh, if they could just cut off 25 miles, just 25 miles of highway, it was going to just clip the border of this where no one was at. They weren't taking the land, it would still be theirs, uh, and they, had, they went and said, uh, you know, can we, can we do that? Of course, they would give them money. Nothing like they got from the casino, so it didn't matter. But um, uh, and they said no. You say why? Well, because when you can say no, everybody has to appeal to you. Everybody has to be nice to you. That is the power, is it not? Uh, I knew a young man. He was uh, he wanted to uh, to start seeing a, a pastor's daughter, and this guy said, um, "Write me a twenty-page essay on why I should let you see my daughter." And a guy said, "I'm not doing that." And he left. But see, it's that, that power of no. And, and during COVID, did we not see our governments exercise the power of no? You can't go out without a mask. You can't, uh, you can't go to, your, uh, to church. You can't go to businesses. Uh, you can't uh, fly without a mask. Uh, and all of that, I mean, governments like the power of no. Is that not true? I'm not preaching against government. Don't worry. That'll be tonight. <laughs> but... Um, um, what I'm going to talk to you about are some things that are predestinated to happen and nobody can stop it. Nobody can say, we're not going to let that happen. We're going to, I, I'm, I'm the government. I've said no to that. Oh, wow. Can you imagine, can you imagine, you know, uh, God has something that's predestined in the future and some government says, well, we've decided that's not going to happen. Well, you should decide something easier than that. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you this morning about things that are going to happen. I want you to go, if you will. Uh, to Titus, the book of Titus, and chapter 2. Now, I, I don't know about you. I got saved. Uh, I was a Roman Catholic before I got saved. I was, a, I was a Roman Catholic. I was a drunkard. I was a thief. I was a Democrat. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and when I got saved, <clears throat> I didn't know anything about the Bible. When, they, when I heard people talk about the Lord coming back a second time, I really did. I thought, He's going to be born in a manger again? And he's got to die on the cross again? That's what I thought. I know it, it, it astounded me. I, I, honest, believe me, uh, the italics in the Bible, I thought they were for emphasis. So when I'd read that verse, I'd say, I'd go, why did they emphasize that word? I just didn't understand it, okay? And so I got this thing down. Uh, in fact, I almost didn't go to Bible college. Um, the, I got saved in a church very much like this one, except it was 5,000 people. Now, that's either a big church an aircraft carrier, or the capital of South Dakota. <laughs> and um, uh, I almost didn't go because in this, I got saved in 1970, and we were so ready for the war to come back, every time we heard a loud car horn, we were three feet off the ground. I mean, just, <laughs> we're ready to go. Uh, and, I, and when I got saved, I talked to the, I, I told the guy that um, led me to Christ, I said, I think God wants me to go to Bible college. And he goes, where are you going to go? I said, I'm not going to go. And I wasn't fighting God, guys, really wasn't. <clears throat> he said, why not? And I said, well, the Lord is going to come back before I get out in 73. And I said, I, I, want to, I, don't, I want to be doing something for God when he comes back. I don't want to be sitting in a, in a classroom doing Greek participles. <laughs> Somebody told me one time, he said, Gip, you know what a participle is. But I know what a participle is. It's half a sipple. <laughs> and, um, and he only told me, he told me the best, he gave me the best advice I could ever get. He said, if God wants you in Bible college, that better be where you are when he finds you. I thought, boy, that's good. And I went. Now, I started in 1970, but I'll be honest with you. When I started, I did not think that I would graduate. In fact, after a while, a whole bunch of people uh, thought the same thing. But, um, but I graduated. But I knew that I would never get married because the Lord was going to come back. Next month, we uh, celebrate 52 years. But I knew we'd never have any children because the Lord's going to come back. We had three boys. But I knew they would never grow up. 
I think I was right about that part right there. <laughs> you would have to know those three boys. Uh, I don't think any of them grew up. But we all talked about the rapture. You heard about the rapture, correct? We're waiting for the rapture. Uh, and then every now and then, did you ever get somebody go, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. I said, well, neither is Trinity, but the Trinity is. If you don't want to call it Trinity, call it the Godhead. And if you don't want to call it the rapture, you know, uh, you could call it the catching away. That's what it's called in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, you would, I like this one. You could call it the translation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Or, here look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing uh, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, isn't blessed hope a nice, a nice name? That is a nice name. Um, you know, down in our country, you've seen what's been going on. Uh, it, is, uh, it is definitely insane. And um, we have a good constitution. We really do. Uh, and I like, uh, I like President Trump. I hope he gets in. I'm surprised. I'll be surprised if he's alive. I, uh, I said that before they ever tried to, to hurt him. But, um, you know, the people I feel sorry for in my country, the most are lost conservatives. Because their hope is Donald Trump and the United States Constitution. Well, that's not my hope. I, I hope he gets in. I hope it all works out good. But isn't it funny that, that they use that word, hope, and then our God said, yeah, but you know who he gave you? He gave you a blessed hope. That's pretty good. So <clears throat> the rapture is going to come. Now, uh, could you imagine if uh, uh, Trudeau tomorrow issued something? Down in our, in our country, uh, our president can, can uh, issue a, an executive order, which overrides Congress, everything, just like a king. I don't know if you guys have that here or not, but you ought to go to states and get some of those. They're really handy uh, for, for the leader. But could you imagine if Trudeau got it tomorrow and said, hey, guys, uh, we've decided that the rapture is not going to happen. The government has said no Canadians can go when the rapture. Are you going to go, oh, man, we can't go now. I mean, really? Can they stop it? No, they can't stop it. They can't do a thing about it. Guys, our God is in control. He runs the whole thing. And if, the, if your government, my government, says there will be no rapture, that would be a good time to laugh. <laughs> it really would. I mean, do you ever see somebody, you know, they just, they kind of, they think they got power, and I, I just speak, and everybody moves. And well, you're going to step up and say, hey, uh, stay out of here. We're running this place. No rapture. And God up in heaven goes, oh, I'm just getting ready. <laughs> no. They can't stop it. So, the blessed hope is coming. And now, I, I want you to know, <clears throat> I may believe something a little bit different uh, than, than most Christians on this, but um, I have Bible for it. I twisted the scripture really well to get this, so I hope you appreciate what I'm about to do. But I want you to go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, you have the Lord uh, talking to the apostles, the eleven, that, uh, that, are, that are there. Now, i got to ask you a question, because uh, you know sometimes a preacher wants you to arrive at a conclusion, so he will lead you, uh, and you're kind of going, well, I'm not sure, but, but, but tell me if this does not make sense. First off, doesn't the Gospel of John say that if everything Jesus Christ did was written down, the world couldn't contain the books? So does that mean there's a whole lot that he did that's off the books? Okay, now, is this a reasonable assumption? Don't you think there were some times when just the Lord and the apostles were alone. And they just talked, which has not been recorded. But they just talked. Um, you know, uh, it, it would just, uh, can you imagine, after it's all over, just thinking about having me with him? So, he is talking with them. Now, look what, it, look what happens. Look at verse 8. And I call this, what I call Acts chapter, eight, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 9, or 8, I call it last minute instructions. But, and this is what he does. He says this. We need to read it first. Uh, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the Lord gave the church, or he gave the apostles, a four-step plan by which to evangelize the whole world. He said, I want you to get Jerusalem. He said, then I want you to get Samaria. Then I want you to get uh, um, I'm sorry, Judea. Then I want you to get Samaria. Then I want you to go to the uttermost part of the earth. 
um, when I go into a new church, and this is obviously not a new church for me, though though you're, you're in a borrowed room, so I can't look for this, but uh, not long ago, uh, might have been just a few weeks ago, um, I, I walked into a new church, never been there before. The first thing I look for is a track rack. I want to see that that church has some tracks for the people in the church to not take. <laughs> but um, you say, why? When I see a track rack on the wall of a church, you know what I know? They care about Jerusalem. This is, Edmonton is your Jerusalem. Okay? Say, well, I don't live there. Well, wherever you live, that's your Jerusalem. So I look for Jerusalem. I, I look for a track rack. Uh, and then I look for some kind of a mission representation, that they have some kind of a mission program uh, where they send missionaries around the world. You say, why? He said, uttermost part of the earth. And uh, guys, we were in different churches, uh, you know, like for 33 years, we had no home, uh, different place every week. And the neat thing about that is you get to see the different way churches represent their missions. Some of them, they'll have a, an alcove or uh, where they have all of their mission stuff. Uh, I was in a church in Washington, and really cool, uh, they had a beautiful little, little alcove in a hallway with all these missionaries. Then they had a screen where everybody could bow down. That's what I thought. And, um, and, and what it was, like you could, you could tap that screen, and, and there would be all the names of the missionaries, and tap that one, and then all this information. About, it was really cool, really, really well, well information. And, and sometimes, uh, like in our church, in our church about a thousand some people, uh, and it's got a long hall foyer. Uh, on the outside of the sanctuary, and we have uh, a double line of the missionaries that we support. And I'll tell, let, me, let me tell you this, guys. One of these days, if God gives you a building, uh, and, and if you have some missionary pictures up there, pray for them. When I go to a new church, when I go to any church, I'm sorry, when I go to any church, you know, I got some time before the service, that kind of thing, I will, uh, I will find their mission board, who they support, and I just pray for every single missionary by name. I'm dying. Excuse me. Anyway, uh, we're going to cut this short. <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes they put the, the mission missionaries in the sanctuary on the walls. So it's all different. Uh, I was in Texas. Now you have to understand, Texas, it's like in the United States, not necessarily part of the United States. Okay? Uh, it had the most unique mission representation. They had uh, a city map. You know, like before... GPS, you bought a map of the city streets, you know. So they had a city map, and over top of it, it said, Our Jerusalem. Oh, well, that's appropriate. Then right next to it, it had a map of Texas, and it said, Our Judea. I thought, this is really good. Uh, and then right next to that, it had a map of the entire United States, which was smaller than the map of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to understand Texans. But anyway, uh, it said, Our Samaria, and then it had a world map, the most part of the world. So... He gives them the four-step pro four process by which to evangelize the world, which you need to remember, not what he said, but what he did not say. No, he did not say uh, until the 21st century. He did not. There is, no, there is no closing clause on this. Matthew chapter 28, go to all the world, and Acts chapter 1, the Lord never said, go win the whole world, teach him until such and such a date, until COVID hits. See what I'm saying? So this is still our, our marching orders. Then look what it says in verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, <clears throat> while they beheld, uh, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, guys, you know, I'm always telling people, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. And, and I get these people go, well, Gip just reads the Bible so he can count how many times he read the Bible. <laughs> okay. I don't. I do count. I don't read it for that reason. But when people say, you know what I ask? What are you counting? Grandchildren? Golf strokes? Oh, that's important. <laughs> right? Antlers? Isn't it funny what people count? And then if you count them, times you read through the Bible, you're carnal? I, I'm hoping to get up to the antler stage where I can be spiritual again. <laughs> but, um, but here's my question. On those times before, when he was talking to the twelve that are not recorded. When he got done talking, he didn't float away. Right? Right? Say yes. Say yes. Say, yes. say in Canadian. Yes. Um, so he's talking to them. I don't think he said this just before this. I don't think he said, uh, now guys, uh, listen, I got to tell you something, but I got to hurry. My cloud will be here in a minute. <laughs> 
I don't think, look at verse 8, and he says, and under the uttermost part of the earth. I don't think when he finished that phrase, he went like this. Five. <laughs> four. Three. What I'm saying is, do you think they had any idea that he was going to float away? No. Now, can you imagine talking to somebody? And, and I, I see Peter, you know. And I see Peter, I, I don't do this, but some people take notes on their hand. And um, I'm sure Peter had a ballpoint pen. <laughs> you wouldn't want to use a knife. But um, <laughs> the Lord says, guys, I want you to go to Jerusalem. And, and Peter, you know, they're all, yeah, got, got, got it, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yeah, Judea. Well, that's good. Uh, Samaria. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know if it's probably Okay. All right. <laughs> Isn't that what happened? There's, he doesn't say I'm going to leave. He just got done talking. He'd gotten done talking there many times, but this time. <laughs> now, if you were talking to somebody and they floated away, do you think it didn't say they watched him till he went to the cloud? I can just see this. They went, in the cloud, he goes, "Okay, guys, he's gone. Want to go fishing?" <laughs> But you, I would watch that cloud for a long time, would you not? And I don't expect to see him coming out of it like, Ugh, but <laughs> I would have stood there. Yeah, you know, there's a word, and we're going to read it in the passage. There's a word called steadfast, and steadfast is standing fast. You are rooted to the spot. If you were talking to somebody, anybody, and they floated away, I don't think you would be quick to leave. I think you'd be. <laughs> And then this leads to one of the most unfair questions in the Bible. Look at verse 10. Uh, and while they looked steadfastly, there it is, they're standing fast toward heaven. As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Come on. That is not fair. He said, Why are you going to look up in heaven? Oh, did you just see what he did? Listen, listen, I've been with him for three and a half years. I have seen him heal dead, uh, sick people, raise the dead, walk on water. I've never seen him fly. <laughs> Would that not get your attention? But didn't they see him go? Didn't they see him go? Do you know what 1 Corinthians 15 says? Uh, I don't know if you know about this, but, but the rapture began right there. The, the great, the best, let's know, <clears throat> started there. That is called the first fruits of our rapture. Um, my country's been in many wars. You don't know this, or may not thought, there's a lot of Americans don't know this, but the United States is still officially at war with one country on this planet. There is one country that the United States is still at war with, officially. It is North Korea. So what do you mean? There was the First World War, you're all familiar with. That ended with an armistice. That war ended. Those, those nations were no longer at war. They are today. The Second World War, same thing. Uh, the Vietnam War that we had, that ended with an official piece of paper. Every war that the United States has ever been in has ended with an official, some sort of, okay, we're done killing each other. There has never been an official end to the Korean War. Um, June 19th, 1950, North Koreans crossed 38th parallel. Uh, they they um, occupied most of Korea. Then they were driven back. And, and the long and short of it was that by 53, they'd gotten together and just said, we'll quit shooting and walked away. The United States and North Korea said, we're going to quit shooting each other. But they never said, we're, we're, we, ha we are at peace. We, there is no war. We could officially go bomb North Korea tomorrow, and there would be no reason that we couldn't do it. Because we're, you say, well, you're at peace. No, we're not at war. We're at war. So, so that war began in 1950, and here we are in 2024, and officially it's still open. Uh, some years ago, some North Korean soldiers were uh, trimming some trees. They had axes. They saw some American soldiers attack them and kill them. Now, if, a, if the Germans did that, or the Japanese, we would say, why did you do that? We're not at war. They could officially say, hey, we're still at war. So they did it. So that war began in 1950, and basically it's still open. That's how the rapture is. The Lord went up. He's called the first fruits. Then when we go up, we are called the harvest, and then there's going to be another one called the gleanings. And I'll explain that, all right? But, but we, we, the, the rapture has officially happened. Now I'm going to ask you again. Did they see him go up? Then they're going to see us go up. You know, we get this uh, a little phrase in, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, and it says, uh, in a moment we'll be changed, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, correct? And because it says we're going to be changed in a moment in the, in the twinkling of an eye, it's always been taught that we're just going to poof 
disappear. That's not true. We're going to be changed in a moment. But they're going to, if we're, if we're going up like he went up, they're going to watch us. Now, what that does is that messes up uh, a lot of people's theory on what the great, uh, de- uh, the great delusion is. Well, you know, the great delusion is going to be that uh, we disappear instantly and nobody's going to understand what happened. And the great delusion is the Antichrist explaining what happened to us. Oh, no. No, no, no. I don't know, uh, I don't know how, how you look at this. I've been around for a long time. The whole world today knows about the rapture. They know that the Lord is coming back. I mean, they may not believe it, but what I'm saying is they've heard it. They've heard that he's going to come back and get us. There was a, uh, I was on the internet, and there was a rapper, a black rapper, uh, and he's one of his, uh, I can't call it a concert, he doesn't sing. I don't know what he does, but <laughs> can at least juggle. <laughs> but, but he looks out at this whole crowd, and he goes, well, Looks like none of you went up in the rapture. I guess you'll have to stay here and go to hell with me. He's the lost guy. He knows about the rapture. Guys, when I was lost, if, if you'd have said six, what is six, six, six? I'd have said, that must be the horsepower on a new Chevy. <laughs> or at least it's a good number to shoot for. Um, if you'd have said rapture, I would have known what you meant. The whole world knows about it. We're, they're going to watch us go. It's not like if we did disappear, they would be scratching their head. I wonder what happened. Oh, my wife told me about this for years. I should have done it. Right? So they're going to watch us go. You say, well, then there's got to be a different delusion. I have a theory on that. doesn't matter what it is. But the fact is that the Lord is coming back, and he is going to take his church out of this world in what's called the blessed hope and the government. Not my government, not your government, not one government on this planet can stop it. They can have a badge that's as big as their chest and said, I have officially said, there will be no rapture in my country. All you other guys, Christians in our country may go up, but in my country, nobody's going up. Are they going to get stuck when the rapture happens? Nope. Everybody goes. It's, and is it not predestined? Yes, it is. In fact, let me give you a thought on that. Um, in in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it talks about until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. The Lord is dealing with the Gentile nations right now, and there's a date when he's going to stop doing that and go back to dealing with Israel. And here's what I used to think, and I've kind of changed what I believe. Uh, I used to think that that fullness of the Gentiles was like a, a date on a calendar in the future, like a birthday, anniversary, like somewhere in God's calendar, uh, it says on this month, on this date, in this year, that's the day the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. After that, I start doing with Israel again. I'm not sure of that. Oh, I still think that it's going to happen. But it says, I believe it's in Genesis chapter 16, verse 15, uh, the Lord is talking to, to, to Abraham, and he said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. I'm going to give you what we now know as Palestine, all that area. But he said, the, the fullness of the Amorites, the, the wickedness of the Amorites is not yet what? Full. The Amorites were living in the land at that time, but their wickedness had not got to where God said, I take any more of this. I can't stay. I'm running them out. They were being wicked, but their, their wickedness had not, had, not come, had not been full. And guys, maybe it's not a date on the calendar. Maybe it's when God can't take any more of what's going on in this world. Because if you look at what's going on in this world, transvestites, uh, transgenders, um, child molesting, don't call it pedophilia. That's their word. Call it child molesting. That's what it is. But look at the evil things that are going on in my country, your country, and around this world right now. Is that not true? And you know who's, you know who's who motivating it all? Gentiles. It's all Gentile nations that's doing it. It's not Israel. It's the Gentiles. And maybe the day, the day is going to come. The Lord's going to just see what's going on in this, in this world and go, I've had it. I am up to here. Isn't that what we say? I am up to here with this. And then the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Whatever and whenever, I don't know the date. Some of my friends have uh, dated the rapture so many times that it surprised God. Okay? <laughs> in fact, if you can date the rapture, if you can find the rapture in the Bible and date it, and that day comes and goes and the Lord hasn't showed up, that proves that you found something in the Bible that even God couldn't find, which is really like a real mark when you go to get a job at a college. But um, guys, one of these days, it's going to be the blessed hope. Every tick of the clock, look, you guys, is this not true? We're, we, when, we, when we dismiss this, this service right here uh, around 5 o'clock, <laughs> Aren't we going to be closer to the blessed hope than you were when you came in? Yeah, the world can't stop that, can they? Ah, they can break your watch. They can stop every clock, but they can't stop time. 
And with every tick, we're coming closer to the Lord saying, come up hither. So the blessed hope is coming, and, and it's going to happen. I think they're going to see us go, uh, and the Lord will deal with that accordingly. Uh, I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. And it says this. Talk about the Antichrist coming. Verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but in, in, in the States, I've seen that falling away. Uh, one of the greatest apostasies in my country was the contemporary movement, where churches left the Lord. Uh, they, you know, they said, we preach the gospel. No, they don't. Uh, a man called one of those, those churches and said, what do I have to get to heaven? And the pastor said, I don't know. Now think about it. How would you like to be out in the jungle and with a guide and you say, where are we? Going? I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Your pastor, if anybody knows they're going to heaven, I'll be the pastor. Somebody asked the pastor's wife in one of those churches, uh, how do we get to heaven? The woman says, well, that's just not as easy as it seems. Let me ask you something, guys. You, I bet there's people that you've done some difficult things. Have you not? You know, salvation wasn't hard. <laughs> salvation was, I'll take it. Uh, maybe dealing with you, getting you to take it was hard. But salvation itself was just asking the Lord to give you what he already paid, bought, bought for you. It was one of the easiest things you ever did, was just accepting Christ. So, so one of these days, the Antichrist is going to come. Um, come falling away first, and then uh, and that man of sin... Be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, there's a couple of things uh, about verse 4. Number one, there are critics of the Word of God. When I say the Word of God, I'm talking about the perfect Bible. I'm talking about your King James Bible. And there are critics of the King James Bible that don't like capital G in that verse. Oh, it should be capital G, because capital G is the real God, and the devil is going to be a little G God. Can I ask you something? Isn't the devil already a little G God? Doesn't 2 Corinthians chapter 4 say, if our gospel be hid, it is hid by the God of this world? The devil has always been a lowercase G God. That's not his goal. You know what he wants to be? He wants to be the capital G God. So that is exactly why it should be capitalized. It would be like this. You are uh, the janitor. Uh, at a major at a major factory or something here, but your family who lives in uh, Ontario, you told them you're the president. Well, how can it hurt? They're there, you're here. And then one day, you open the front door and they go, surprise! Yeah. <laughs> we came, we want to see your company. Okay. And you, you, you make sure, you make a phone call before you do it, then you all get in the car, and you pull into the parking lot of, your, of where you work, and there is an open parking space that says reserved for the president. And you pull right into that spot. And they go, oh. you say, this is my spot. You are the president of the company. Yes, I am. You have me right here. How could I not be the president if I parked in this spot? Okay, we have to go now. That is what the devil wants. How could, he wants to be recognized as God. So who is supposed to be sitting in the temple? capital G God. So he's got to sit there to prove that he is God. But it says sitteth in the temple of God. Guys, the rapture or, or, or that that uh, occasion could not happen tomorrow because the temple's not here. It's got, but you know what that, what that verse tells you? The temple is going to be rebuilt. That's It's going to happen. And don't you think there's a lot of people out there, most of them Muslims, who, want, who would die to see that that does not happen? But it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. Uh, I've heard several things. You know, I, I run a Bible college down in the States. And I, and I teach my students what I think is correct. And then I'll take anything else that might be different than what I teach and ridicule it and downplay it and say how <laughs> stupid it is. Can you believe something? But... <laughs> no, you know what I do? I tell them, I say, guys, I don't think, that, in fact, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to do this here. Uh, I'll, I'll say, guys, I don't think this is how it's going to work out, but I want them to hear the other side or, or the other side, so the, the, whatever might be a theory. And so I have heard this about the temple. Of course, you know, it's that, uh, what is the Dome of the Rock, the Golden Dome. I've seen that. We've been in Jerusalem. And, and 
everybody says, well, that's the side of the temple, and that's got to be knocked down, and the Jews got to put their temple up there. I have heard somebody say, well, that's not the exact location. Actually, the temple would be, if you ever went to the Wailing Wall, if you're over there, that, that wall of the Wailing Wall is actually one of the walls of the temple, and it could be built tomorrow in Jewish territory. Okay, I personally think the Dome of the Rock is where it's at. You know why? You know what that rock is? There's a rock there. That's why it's called the Dome of the Rock. There's a large rock there. It was a threshing floor. It was where a farmer took his wheat and beat it against that rock, and the, and the chafe was blown away, and he got the wheat off of the rock. That's what that rock was for. That is the rock of Genesis chapter 22 when Abraham was going to offer Isaac unto the Lord. That is the rock. So I think that is where the temple was, and I think that's where they're going to put it. But then I heard this. I heard a guy say, the Jews don't have to build the temple. Well, it doesn't it say it's going to be a temple? But they've got, to be, they've got to build a temple. Now, when I say build a temple, I'm talking about an edifice. I'm talking about huge stone put in place, mortared. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. This guy said they don't have to build a temple. I think they've got to build a temple. All they have to do is put up the tabernacle. I thought, the tabernacle is a tent. The temple is a building. That, they're not the same. Uh, let me ask a question. Um, have any of you ever been to Lancaster, Pennsylvania in the United States? Way on the East Coast. You have. Okay. In Lancaster, a lot of Amish people. You guys know what? Uh, Hutterites? Okay. We call them Amish. We also call them get out of the way you're, you're driving too slow. <laughs> but um, not in, and it's big Amish country. People go there to see the Amish and eat the food and, and all that stuff. But there's a Mennonite college in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And on the campus of that college, open to the public, they have, in a room, a life-size reproduction of the tabernacle. Guys, it would fit here. It probably wouldn't fit. The ceiling is probably a little too low. But it would fit. It, I don't think it goes from back of that piano to that piano there. That's about the... It was us. It was not big. It had to be portable. And so they've got this life-size reproduction of what the Old Testament tabernacle looked like. Do you know what's really great? Uh, you know, I, again, I don't know what you're about Mennonites, but in, in our country, Mennonites, they go from one extreme to the other. They go from looking like Amish with their horse and buggies and everything, uh, all the way to looking like you and me, and you would never know there's any difference. Um, and, and this, they've always got some old order Mennonite man or woman, old woman, old man, never young, who is as saved as you are. And you ought to, you, it's worth going just to hear them give the gospel. I mean, they just about preach. Do you know who gets the gospel in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Jews. Jews have never seen their own tabernacle. And when they, if they're visiting Lancaster, Pennsylvania, they hear there's a, there's a tabernacle at this, this college. I'll go and see it. And I'm, I've been in there. I remember this one old uh, Mennonite lady, and, and I got about three guys with the little, the little doily on his head. And this lady is, I mean, she has all but given an invitation. I mean, she has given the gospel. Isn't that good? I think that's good. Well, this guy says all they got to do is put that up. Because I don't care how fast they work. Isn't it going to take some time to clear the site, put a block, put a block, put a block. You're going to measure it all off, make the mortar. Building a building is going to take a while. I still think it's going to be a building. But this guy said, no, all they got to do is put the tabernacle up, and they can put that up overnight. Uh, temple and tabernacle are two different things. Now, let me ask you a question. I, I think I know the answer. I hope you give me the right answer because I hope you're right. Um, it, do you accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Do you? Okay. Now, I want you to know, most Christians, when they say that, they don't accept the Bible as their final authority. On all matters. They say that because you're supposed to say that. What they accept the Bible as... Uh, it's where I get my doctrine from, and it's where I find the verse that proves that I'm right and the guy that I argued with is wrong. That's what the Bible is for, to show the brother why I'm right and you're wrong. Um, but it is our final authority in all matters, all matters of faith and practice. Now, I want you to open your Bible. I want you to go to a good uh, a book with a good, honest-sounding name. Go to 1 Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel. Well, it was slow getting through there, I'll tell you what. I'm worried about the crowd, okay? And you know the story. In 1 Samuel, there was Hannah. Hannah could not have any children. She was grieved. She was praying, asking God to give her, give her a child. And look what it says in verse 9. 
So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat at a, by a post of the, what's your Bible say? What's the word? Temple. Do you know what he's sitting by? Guys, this is a century before the temple was built. This is 100 years. In metric, that's 145 years. That is, it's 100 years before they built the temple, and, and the Lord just said this guy's sitting by the temple when he's sitting by a post of the tabernacle. So my final authority, this book, your final authority, did it not just call the tabernacle the temple? Uh, Bible says if God says something twice, it is established. Look at chapter 3. And in chapter 3, look at verse 3. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. So twice our Bible, our final authority, called that tabernacle, that tent. Twice God called it the temple. Now, with that having, having said that, I still believe they're going to put up a stone edifice. I believe they're going to put up the third temple is going to be grand. But I might be wrong. It might just be the tabernacle. And we have scripture that if it is a tabernacle and somebody goes, well, that's not the temple. God called it the temple twice. Whether it's the tabernacle, whether it's a stone edifice, there's going to be a third temple. It's going to be built. Uh, I don't understand 1967, the, the uh, Six-Day War, when the Jews whipped everybody around them. I don't know why Moshe Dayan didn't knock that gold dome down then. He said, well, you started a war. They just finished a war. <laughs> they had already won. That's when you knock it down. You knock it down today, you got some trouble. I don't know how it's going to come down. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe the Wailing Wall, they can put it there. Maybe that's it. Look, I may be wrong about it being a stone bu building. I may be wrong about its exact location, but it's going to be built. And if the Jews today, even if it was not on the Dome of the Rock, if the Jews today said, we found out that the Wailing Wall is part of the temple and we're going to build the third temple, don't you know this world would go insane trying to stop it? But they can't stop it. Maybe it'll go up overnight. A tent. A tabernacle. Maybe that's how it'll go. All I'm telling you is that that third temple is going to be built so that the Antichrist can walk in there and sit down and say, look at this. Is this not God's chair? Yeah. Well, who's sitting in it? So I am God. That's what he's going to do. And that's going to happen. Now, I want to give you a, a, another thought. If you're anything like Americans, you probably haven't had one. So I'm going to give you a thought. Um, <laughs> Doesn't the Antichrist have to endear himself to the whole world? He has to make the whole world love him. How's he going to do that? Uh, I don't think he's going to. I don't think he's going to stop every war. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, he's certainly not going to balance the uh, the fiscal budget of every nation. So what is he going to do? And I don't know. Uh, but I had a preacher friend say this. He said, "What at the end? now? Now, guys, do you know what?" The greatest source, people, the greatest source of death is in this country, or in this world, Islam. Uh, they're killing Christians, they're killing Jews, they're killing communists in China, uh, they're killing Hindus, they're killing Buddhists, they're killing Muslims. Are they not? They're killing everybody. And what if some leader of a country said, I've had enough of that, and whipped them? I mean, just pounded them to sand where they said, no more, no more, no more. Wouldn't that be a good thing? It, now, this guy said that, and when he said that, he said, okay, and let's go a little farther. What if that happens, and then he goes to the Jews and said, knock that dome down, put your temple up. They can't do anything about it, I beat them. Wouldn't that be a good thing? And then he says this, oh, and guys, when you get it done, I'd like to be for the dedication. Oh, yeah. And so maybe it takes about three and a half years to put that temple up. Halfway through the first half of the tribulation. And he shows up. And they go, oh, we're so glad you're here. See, this This is your seat. This is the best seat. You can sit there and see everything that's going to go on in all of our celebration. This is reserved for you. And he goes, no, no, I'm not going to sit there. Oh, yeah, 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 that is the that is your seat. That's the best seat. There's nobody going to sit there. No, no, uh, I, I know I'm going to sit. Sir, sir, there's no better seat in the, yeah, there's one better seat. And I'm going to sit where I belong. And he's their hero until he turns around and puts one foot on the steps up to the temple. When he puts his foot there and starts at that temple, they may appreciate that he, he let them build their temple, but they're going to say, you can't go up there. And he's going to say, I can, because I belong there. And he's going to go into that temple, to the seat of God, and sit in that temple and say, I am God. And when the Jews go say, you can't, don't belong here, that's when he's going to say, I'll kill you all. 
So there's going to be a blessed hope. We're going to leave. We're out of here. I'm not going through the tribulation. Some of my brethren want to go through the tribulation. <laughs> to be very honest, I would like some of my brethren to go through the tribulation. Okay? Um, I had a mother-in-law. That is as close to tribulation as I want to get. Okay? But um, uh, the blessed hope is going to happen. The building of the temple is going to happen. There's going to be <clears throat> a one world leader. And this is the most amazing thing. Go back to Revelation and look at chapter 13. There have been many men through history who wanted to rule the world. Uh, many of them ruled what was most of the known world. Uh, Genghis Khan. He had a, he had a huge domain. Um, Mussolini, Hitler, uh, uh, Mao Zedong. They wanted to be a dictator. And nobody gets up and says, I want to be a dictator. And the next day they're a dictator. Uh, Adolf Hitler was, uh, was, in 1933, he was elected to be the Chancellor of Germany. It took him seven years before he could declare, I am the dictator. I am the absolute ruler. So he became Chancellor in 33, but it wasn't until 1940 when he said, now I have the power. All I got to do is say it. Caesar, you understand what I'm saying? So there's going to be a one world government. There's going to be a single man running the world. Now what's crazy about that? Could you imagine some guy, it takes you seven years to become the absolute dictator? And when you get there, well, I'm, the, I'm the dictator. I'm, I, my, my word is law. And the first thing I'm going to do is give it to you. You can be the dictator. Have you ever seen a dictator, when he finally got the power, say, I'll give it to somebody else? Oh, no, man. They hang on to it. They hang on to it because they like that power. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I stood, uh, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up. Uh, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten uh, crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast is the Antichrist. He's the man. Now watch what it says. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. I'm not trying to misread this verse, but does it not sound like the beast shows up and the dragon already has the government in place and hands it off to him. That's what it sounds like. That's an amazing thing. But what that means, now first off, I think the beast has to be alive today. <laughs> Just check it. Um, but he does. I mean, if the, if the beast isn't alive today, guys, we aren't going up for a long time. And I do believe that we will see him. I do not believe we'll go through the tribulation, but we may see him, him rise. But before he gets into power, there's got to be the dragon. Now, we know the dragon is the devil, but he has an organization down here. Now, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it uh, the Illuminati. You can call it the Bilderbergers, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Democrats. Call it what you want. But they are working. Did you not see during covid how suddenly world governments became absolute powers, and especially in European nations. I mean, nothing was worse than Australia. They put them in camps and got mad at them if they, if they weren't in that camp to where somebody else in that camp was. They couldn't even go out of their place uh, and talk to somebody else in the camp. They were prison camps. Uh, there's word that they're building those now in our country, which I thought was crazy because back in 1970, I heard they had them. But <laughs> it's crazy, okay? But I think what we're seeing, if you wonder what's going on, I think we are seeing the dragon assemble the one world government. Uh, in our country, our, uh, the guy in the White House, he's not the president, he's the resident. <laughs> and he signed some kind of an order that if there's another pandemic, you remember how COVID was and how they shut you down? That's why I'm here. I'm here because uh, Brother Joe knows, and I, I preach for Brother uh, uh, Carlson, and when, when they shut down COVID, I said, I am not letting them put a needle in my arm. And I'm not coming to Canada, give them 2,000 bucks and sit in a motel for two weeks. Just not happening. I'm not doing that in any other country. So I just, we stopped international. This first has been international since uh, 19, uh, 2019. And so I'm not doing it. But when they relaxed those, I said, now we're going to go. But it was in, it, the, the world is putting the, the one world government together. So they're going to get it. Now, that does not mean you have to lay down and say, well, it's going to happen. We can't fight it. You're told, to be, you're told to hate evil. I don't think we should hate anything. Then you're unbiblical. 
we are told to hate evil. And you know what you've been seeing is evil. Is that not true? So there is evil out there, and we're supposed to resist it. We have it, what you just said, you know, we're probably a year or two from the rapture, maybe even a month. So why bother? Because it's all got to come down. Because we all may be wrong about right now. I heard an, an American preacher, a, a tape of him preaching in 1924. I was not there. <laughs> and he was preaching about the rapture coming within the next year or two. Let me ask you something. When Hitler took power in Germany and began to persecute the Jews, don't you think there were Christians in this country saying, man, he's got to be the Antichrist. The end is near, right? What if you laid down in, in 1924? What if you gave up and said, hey, the rapture's coming anyway. Let's not do anything. We don't have to work. Or 1940, 41. Well, Hitler's out to the Antichrist. Well, we're going to be out of here in a month or two. Why bother serving the Lord? All... And guys, it never happened. And I know Christians around this world right now are more convinced that the rapture is happening. I mean, it is imminent, correct? And then we use a good thing, the blessed hope, as an excuse to do a bad thing. Nothing. Uh, guys, I am working on five books right now. I've got one book I've been working on for over a decade. It's a, it's a catalog of all, of the, Greek, uh, all, all the manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And I am, I, I am, there's one time I was booked 12 years into the, into, into, into the future. I don't believe I'm going through the tribulation, but I got to stay. Because if the rapture would have happened, the Lord would have said, Gip, you're already booked all the way through it. And half those guys are still there anyway, so going back down. <laughs> but, um, and, and I still think he's coming imminently, but I might be wrong. Because when I got saved at age 20, there are guys my age now who never thought they would die. And they have. So, I don't know. I do think we are at the very end. But that's what they thought in 1924. That's what they thought in 1940. Don't let the thought that the rapture is about to happen give you an excuse to do nothing for God. That is not why God tells you that. It's called the blessed hope, not the blessed siesta. And you, you need to keep working. But there's going to be a one world government. Um, there is going to be a worldwide tribulation. Now, guys, I'm sorry. I'm an American. You know, you're American. No, they think you know, they're the number one country in the world. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> you peasants. <laughs> eh? Anyway. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, you know the United States, if it's anything, it has become the world policeman. And if the United States, if there were no Bible and no rapture and, and none of this was true, if the United States goes down, there's going to be a worldwide tribulation. There are, there are economies that are going to collapse. There are nations next to each other that hate each other that are holding back because we are keeping them back. And uh, you're going to see some nations go after each other if, if that happened. But it's, it's good. there's going to be a worldwide tribulation. Now, uh, I've got some people, like I said, some people think they're going halfway through it. Uh, some people think it's only three and a half years. I believe it's seven years. And let me tell you what I, how I describe the, tri uh, the tribulation to my students. I call it the, the Lord turning the world for seven years into a free fire zone. Now, if you don't know what a free fire zone is, some years ago we were at war with Vietnam. And uh, you'd have some American soldiers, and all of a sudden one of them gets shot. And they'd look over there, and the shot came out of that, that jungle right there. And they go in, and when they get through the trees, they find four or five Vietnamese guys working on their rice. And they know one of them is the bad guy. So you know what they would do? They would go into, if this is where they get, they would go into an entire area and move everybody out. They would move every village. They'd give them new houses. They would get them out of there. Now there is no one in this area that, that has any, an excuse to be there. And it's called a free fire zone, which means now all I have to do is see a guy, armed or not. All I got to see him, if he's in a free fire zone, I can shoot him. I'm free to shoot him. That is what God is going to do to this world if this is seven years right here, that's what you're going to do this world. You say, why? Maybe he's tired of the jokes. Maybe he's tired of being on everybody's lips when they get mad. Oh, oh Jesus. Right? Maybe he's going to get tired of the hole in his son's side. Maybe he's going to get tired of the nails in his hands and the crown of thorns. You know, people think, oh, God's docile. God is not docile. God is in heaven, but he's not in the geriatric section. He's not sitting in a wheelchair with a long white beard going, Raptor, 
He is a vengeful God. Well, he's not vengeful. He is vengeful. Didn't he say what? What is mine? What did he say? Vengeance is mine. The reason we don't think about that is because he is some other things that we are <clears throat> greatly benefiting from. He's merciful. And he's gracious. I'll bet you, I'll bet you everyone that's been saved any length of time, you could give a testimony today of some time in your life when the mercy of God was visible. Or the grace. Now, let me explain this. I, I define mercy and grace like this. Mercy is not getting the bad you deserve. Uh, I was sentenced in 1966. I stole two cars uh, off a, new, a dealer lot uh, for friends of mine and I. And I was sentenced to a place called Mansfield Reformatory. Some of you may have seen Mansfield Reformatory. Oh, I don't know Yeah, but you may have seen it. There's a movie out there called The Shawshank Redemption. Anybody ever see that movie? Okay. Why are you looking at movies? <laughs> anyway, the opening scene is this very ominous looking prison. That's, that's the Mansfield Reformatory. It's closed now, and they use it for that movie. And um, the, the, uh, my judge, he sends me to six months in that place. And then he said, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to send you. I'm going to make it two years probation. That's called mercy. You understand? Um, when I was uh, 19 years old, 19, 1969, about, right about a year before I got saved, uh, four friends of mine and I would just closed the bar. We were drunk. And uh, it was raining. And we got this guy's Mustang, and he was airing it out. I mean, a driving rainstorm, and he got a piece of straight country road, and he, I can still, he was screaming. We got there this long straightaway, and the road made a left. And we made most of a left, but not enough. And, uh, you know, I remember tumbling and bouncing, uh, and ultimately, the car ended up on its right side. Um, one guy was half in, half out. I got busted up uh, in that car wreck. And the, the insurance man that I saw maybe sometime after that, uh, he said, here's what you guys did. He said there was a concrete conduit, and he said, a culvert, and he said, you peeled 40 feet of concrete like a sardine can. And he said, you hit it head on. And at the end of that, I don't know if you have them here, uh, but, but many, many years ago, what they, they'd make a storm sewer, and it looked like a brick chimney with a manhole cover. At the end of this conduit, that was one of those. And he said, when you hit that, you shattered it and then started end over end. So we tumbled end over end, side over side, came to rest. Now, I'm about to say something, and somebody in this room is going to want to say amen, and I don't want to embarrass you, so do not say amen. Please, don't say amen to what I'm about to say. People have that kind of thing happen before they're saved. And if I'd have died that night, I'd have gone to hell, correct? Now, don't say amen. With it. Don't, don't, don't say amen. And we say, but by the grace of God. I didn't go to hell that night. Nope. By the mercy of God. If I had died that night, I would have gone to hell, correct? But wasn't that, the, wasn't that the bad I deserved? The fact that God did not let me die that night was not the grace of God. It was the mercy of God. Not getting the bad I deserved. And then a year later, I got saved. You saved? You deserve it? No. Saved by grace. You got something good, didn't you? I'm telling you guys. So mercy and grace. I appreciate that. And what, what he's going to do, he's going to make this a free fire zone. So for 12, or, or I'm sorry, for, I almost extended the tribulation. For seven years, God is going to unload on this world. I don't know if you ever thought about this. Again, I don't know if you ever thought. But um, did you ever see pictures of Berlin in 1945 after the war? Piles of rubble, right? How about uh, Hiroshima after the bomb? Piles of rubble. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but do you know what this world is going to look like after seven years of 50-pound blocks of ice falling on it? 50 pounds. That is like 18 kilometers in metric. 50-pound blocks of ice. You've seen a large block of ice. Can you imagine it's falling out of the sky? How many of those kind of storms could this building withstand? Oh, it might stand, but the roof would be gone, and after a while, the floors would be gone. It's amazing. And when it's all done, there's not even any shrapnel left over because it all melts away. This world, if, you're, if, you're, if you believe in investing, invest in construction. Because the first hundred years of millennium are going to be rebuilding. And this world is going to be a free fire zone. But, as I told you, before our soldiers turned an area in Vietnam into a free fire zone, they went in and removed the innocent citizens. So before God turns this world into a free fire zone, you know what he's going to do? 
He's going to remove the innocents. So we go up, then there's a seven-year tribulation. Um, I believe this. I believe that, um, well, I'll tell you, I do believe there's a mid-tribulation rapture. It's not ours. We're going to be going. Listen, when this rapture happens, right in the middle of the tribulation, you and I will have been in heaven eating fried chicken for three and a half years. <laughs> I like that idea. So, so what are you talking about? Uh, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 10. And get, uh, well, we'll look at Matthew chapter 10 first. And Matthew chapter 10, the Lord sends out the 12. And here's what he says. Uh, verse, the Bible says, verse 1. And when he called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So that's what they were sent out to do. And then in verses 2 and 3 and 4, he names those apostles. And then it says this in verse 5. Look very careful. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe there's somebody here who was Jewish before you got saved. But weren't most of us, before we got saved, Gentiles? Well, you just got dealt out. Jesus came to die. Well, if, if the gospel, if he came to give the gospel, didn't he just exclude us? Go not in the way of the Gentiles. And in any city of Samaritan center, you're not, but go rather, uh, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he says, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, go only to the Jews, and what shall you preach? Seven. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Israel had been waiting centuries for the Messiah to come. Centuries. Um, I'll show you something. Keep place here, but look at Isaiah chapter 38. Something happens in Isaiah 38. Hezekiah is about to die. And Isaiah chapter 38, look what it says, verse 1. In those days Hezekiah was sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him. Uh, now, now think about this. Hezekiah was a good king, right? And him and Isaiah had a relationship. They were friends. So you're Hezekiah. You're... Your doctor says, I don't think you're going to make it. You're going to die. And somebody says, Isaiah's coming. Oh, he's going to heal me. He knows I'm a good king. I'm a, he's a man of God. And so you're waiting. Waiting to hear. You'll you're, be healed. And he comes and says, uh, get your house in order. You're going to die. <laughs> what do you mean die? Look what it says. Thus saith the Lord, verse, middle of verse 1, set thine house in order, for thou, uh, for thou shalt die and not live. That kind of die. Okay? Made it very clear. What do you mean by die? Like, not live. <laughs> right. So he hears he's going to die. And he's bummed out. He's bummed out for two reasons. Look at verse 9. The writing of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness, I said to the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. Uh, I am deprived of the residue of of my years. The Bible says, you know this, that the years of a man are how many? Seventy. Uh, I'm, I'm over warranty protection. Okay? I'm 74. Uh, I was telling the preacher yesterday, I said, I'm, I'm still preaching. I said, I'm hoping since I turned 70, I'm getting paid time and a half. <laughs> but the years of a man are 70, so he's not 70 yet. You know what he said? I'm not gonna, I'm not even going to make it 70. I'm not, even, I'm not going to get the residue of my years. But there was another reason he was, he was bummed. Look at the next verse. Verse 11. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. Say, so was he waiting for the rapture? Nope. Nope. See, we're waiting for the Lord to come back. I want to ask this question. I, I'm, I'm sure it's true of the preacher's children. How many of you, you were born into a home that, that is Christian, and all of your life you heard about the Lord coming back in the rapture, the blessed hope of God. How many of you were, all, you were raised hearing about the Lord coming back? You've been expecting to see him all your life, right? Say yes. Hit her. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what if you found out you're going to die tomorrow? I mean, we do believe the rapture is close. But what if you found out you're going to die tomorrow? You go, oh man, I'm not going to see the Lord come back. Right? He wasn't waiting for the Lord to come back. You know how he was raised? He was a Jew, and he was a king. And he said, all his life he said, you know what, Hezekiah? Our, our Messiah is going to come someday. 
and you might be the king sitting on the throne when it happens. You know what I think would have, it must have been like, you imagine being the king and the Messiah comes in and you get to be the one to take the crown off your head, put it on his, and your robe, put it on his back, have him sit in the royal throne and get on your knees and say, my Lord and my God. He was looking for the first coming of the Lord and he thought, I'm not going to see it. He didn't. It was uh, about 700 years away. But all of his life, he thought that was going to happen. So all of our life, we've been waiting for the rapture uh, to get out of here. So you're going to have seven years. Now, here's what I believe. And you can believe what you want. You can disagree with me, okay? Just don't come and tell me because I don't care. <laughs> I'm tainted. I'm bent. I'm crazy. I'm not interested in what you think. I, people always say, oh, you know, I, I think you're wrong there. Well, tell the chair. <laughs> It's about as bright as I am, and you'll get about as far with that with your complaint. Um, there's going to be a there's going to be a uh, ministry of Moses and Elijah. Correct? Say yes. Say yes. okay. It's going to be three and a half years. Look at uh, look at Revelation chapter eleven. Oh wait, wait! Don't don't leave ten. Don't leave Matthew ten. We got to look at a little thing. Look at verse twenty two. He's telling what's going to be going on uh, in the tribulation. Uh, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. That is not for you and me. That's for people in tribulation. That's for Jews. Now, uh, I got to do this before uh, before we go to, uh, somebody remind me, you got to go to Revelation 11. This is Matthew 11. And in Matthew 11, he says, go to the Jews. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Right? Look at chapter 12. And look at verse 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth, uh, he shall show forth judgment to the Gentiles? Didn't he just tell them, don't go to the Gentiles in chapter 10? And didn't he just say in chapter 12, we're going to the Gentiles? Look at verse 21. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now, guys, there's no contradictions in the Bible. But doesn't that kind of sound like one? <laughs> Like 10, don't go to the Gentiles. 12, go to the Gentiles. Make up your mind. He didn't, he didn't make up his mind. Somebody else did. Something had to happen between Matthew 10 and Matthew 12 to get the Gentiles in, correct? Okay, this is going to be uh, maybe a tough question. Our public schools are very bad. I don't know what yours are like. But does anybody, can anybody tell me what comes between 10 and 12? 11 thank you a brave soul 11 oh, wait a minute he says in 10 go preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand I'm about to set up what we now know what, what we now call the millennium tell the Jews the kingdom of heaven is at hand and then in chapter 12 he says go to the Gentiles go to the Gentiles don't go to the Gentiles here go to the Gentiles here something had to happen in chapter 11 to change everything and I want you to know this you are holding in your lap the word of God and Matthew chapter 11 is one of the most pivotal chapters in history. Chapter 11 of Matthew absolutely changed everything, including the fact that you are sitting here right now having been Gentiles and being saved. Look at chapter 11. Now, we know that Israel rejected their Messiah, correct? But I don't think they just outly, outwardly just went, I hate him. Let me ask you this. I, and I, what I'm asking you, I'm, I'm trying to keep this all within Scripture. I'm not making this up. Didn't even the Lord say there were many that came before him and said, I'm the Christ? Right. So I don't think the Jews just said, I think that guy's him. I think that guy's not. Don't you think there was one of those analytical guys? I hate those mathematicians. But they, they're analytical. And, and, there, and you know, he knew the Old Testament prophecy better than anybody else. I call him Ivan. Okay. And some guy shows up and says, I'm your Messiah. And they go to Ivan. He says, hey, Ivan, he said he's our Messiah. What do you think? And you know what my, Ivan's got? He's got a list of every scripture, every prophecy that the Messiah has to fulfill. And he goes, uh, well, I don't know. What tribe's he from? Benjamin. Oh, you're not the Messiah. Why? Well, because it says right here, he's going to be a tribe of Judah. He's, not, he's out. Another guy shows up. I'm the Messiah. Hey, Ivan, this guy says he's the Messiah. What do you think? What tribe? Judah. Well, okay, okay, that's a yes. Um, but not just Judah. He's got to be from the line of David. Is he line, from, line of David? No. Oh, not the guy. This guy, Jesus, shows up. Hey, Ivan, you think he's the Messiah? Well, I don't know. What well, tribe? Judah. Okay. Well, he's got that right. 
Oh, uh, yeah, but, he, but he's got to be of the, of the seed of David. He is. Oh, he is. Okay. And one by one, Ivan is checking, yes. Oh, you know what? Jesus can't be the guy. Why? Well, because it says the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, and he's from Nazareth. Oh, yeah, he lives in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. Oh, can you imagine a, a, like a little bit of excitement beginning to build? Every prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus Christ is getting a yes, 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 yes. And he's standing out here. He's got more yes checks than he's ever had in his life. And they say, so Ivan, you think he's the Messiah? No. No. Look at all those yeses. Yeah, but I got a no here. I can't put I can't. There's one here. I can't change. What is it? It says before our Messiah shows up, Elijah shows up. And nobody named Elijah showed up before this Jesus. In fact, we asked that guy, John the Baptist, are you Elijah? What did he tell us? No, I'm not. So Elijah never showed up before this guy named Jesus. I can't check yes. He can't be the Messiah. That was the one problem that Israel's faced with. There was no Elijah before Jesus. Now, I want to say this. I say this not disparagingly. I want to say this. Jesus Christ healed many people. Did he not? I mean, blind, deaf, dumb, dumb. The Greek word for dumb is democrato. <laughs> um, he was so good, he could heal 10 lepers at once. He raised the dead. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to say, but none of those, none of those things that he did were compassion-driven. Oh, he saw somebody blind, and he felt bad for him, so he healed him. No, he saw somebody blind, and he healed him. Oh, I'm sure he had. But you know what it says? It says in the, uh, Mark chapter 6, don't, don't go there, feeding 5,000, he saw them as a shepherd, a sheep not having a shepherd, and he, had come, he was moved with compassion. It wasn't compassion about the healings. You know what it was? It was credentials of the Messiah. There were things that Jesus Christ had to do. On Ivan's list was, the Messiah is a healer. How do you know? Look at chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent to his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that shall come, or do we look for another? Who was John the Baptist? Was he not the forerunner of Jesus Christ? Was he not? We now know this. He was Elijah in spirit. Not reincarnated, but he was Elijah in spirit. But wasn't he this? He had a claim none of the apostles could make. No one else in the Bible could make. No, he was? He was Jesus' cousin. Weren't they cousins in the flesh? Does anybody here have a cousin? Can you remember who they are? I've had people say, John the Baptist sent Jesus, uh, sent two disciples to Jesus to ask him if he was the one or who he looked for. He said he forgot who he was. That was some party. <laughs> Guys, it wasn't he didn't remember who he was. Try to think what you would do. You are in jail. And your cousin, who is the forerunner, you were the forerunner of, who is the Lamb of God, is that what John called him? The taking away of the world? Oh man, my cousin's going to get me out of here. Jesus, he can walk on water. He can raise the dead. He can get me out of here. I don't know if this means anything to you people. This is a blessing and it warms my heart. Your God has been involved actively in three prison breaks. Hallelujah. <laughs> we may need that in the coming days. So what John's doing is he's slapping Jesus in the face. He says, go up there and say, are you the one smack or should we look for another? And look what Jesus Christ said. To identify himself as the Messiah. Look how he did it. Verse 3. And he said unto him, Art thou he, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear, hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Those were his credentials that proved that he was the Messiah. And then, just for the record, he, gives, he says, oh, go slap John too. Slap him back. Look at the next verse. Six. And blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. <laughs> Just smack my cousin with that. But he is the, the, the credentials of the Messiah were he was a healer. That's what he said. But this chapter, he deals with that problem. Where was Elijah? And look at verse seven. And as he departed, Jesus began to speak. Uh, to say unto the multitudes uh, concerning John, what went ye out in the wilderness to see, a reed shaken with a wind? 
But what we now to see? Man clothed in soft raiment, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? For to see, a prophet? Yea, I say to you, and more than a prophet. But this is he. Now, verse 10. I want you to imagine this scene. Jesus talking to Israel. And in that crowd is Ivan with all those yeses and a great big red no for Elijah. And you know what? When Jesus Christ says this in verse 10, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. That is the prophecy of Elijah coming. And when Ivan hears that, he goes, well, How is he going to do this? Verily I say unto you, verse 11, Among the, the born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven shall be, uh, is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and violence taken by force. Now watch this. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Didn't he just say, up to John, every Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah has now been fulfilled? There's no more prophecy. All the prophets prophesied until John. John, it ended there. Verse 14. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come, uh, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He just said this to Israel. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've healed people. I'm from Judah. I'm from, da I'm from David. I, I've done every I was born in Bethlehem. If you guys will accept John as Elijah, I, we can start this thing right now. Now, I'm a King James Bible believer. I wouldn't change a word. But you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to retypeset it. And you see verse 15 and 16? Entirely too close. I would put about a half an inch of white space. I know this. I know you've, you ever, anybody ever asked you something and you said no? But have you ever said no without speaking? Yeah. You, somebody says it and you go, uh, you know, you ever go to an auction and you scratch your nose and just bought a car? <laughs> I think Israel stood there like this with their hands in their pockets going, And with their silence, they rejected their Messiah. Chapter 10. Go to the Jews. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Chapter 11. If you guys will take John as Elijah, we start it right now. Okay. Then I'll go to the Gentiles. Chapter 12. He's mad in verse 16. Look what he says. But where unto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto a children sitting in the markets and calling their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, you have not danced, we have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. You know what he just said? You guys have, whoops. He said, You guys have asked my father to send me for centuries. You have, you have prayed and said, Send the Messiah, send the Messiah. Now God did it, and you just rejected me. And what do we say about a guy that his whole world collapses? We say, Oh man, he went to the dogs. <laughs> we were the dogs and we got in so that but what happened came to heaven slipped through the fingers didn't it the, chapter 10 don't go to the Gentiles go to the Jews tell them came to heaven's at hand chapter 11 take John as I, Elijah we can start it they didn't chapter 12 go to the Gentiles chapter 13 the kingdom of heaven goes into a mystery form and it has remained there Somebody, again, is going to have to preach the message of the kingdom of heaven that is found in Matthew chapter 10. But it's not going to be 12 guys. Look at chapter 24. And chapter 24 is very similar to chapter 10 because Elijah is going to show up in the beginning of the tribulation. He's preceding the Messiah. Look what it says in verse uh, 3. And as they sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? Now, watch this. Preacher, pastor, Pastor Joe, when are you coming? <laughs> That's a great expression. <laughs> I mean, he's sitting right there, right? How could I say, Joe, when are you coming? He's here. But isn't that what they just said to Jesus Christ? He's sitting in front of them, and they go, when are you coming? They're finally getting it. They're finally getting the kingdom of heaven is not coming right now. But one of these days you're going to bring it. When are you going to do that? And he says, verse, 11, verse 4, 
And Jesus answered them and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And there shall, ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you uh, be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence, COVID, and earthquakes in divine place, uh, device, device, diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Oh, look at verse 10, by the way. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's exactly what he said in Matthew 10. So he's right now, right in the tribulation. And look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. He says, what I did in Matthew 10, I'm going to do again. I sent a dozen guys out and said, go to the Jews and tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he's not going to send a dozen. He's going to send 144,000. Say, why? You know about the flood. You believe in the flood. Everybody died but eight people, correct? Uh, I don't know if you know this, but it took them a while to, to regenerate. And they say, they think that by, at the time of Christ, when he was walking the earth, the entire population of the world was only 200,000 people. 200 million, 200 million. That's more people, that's fewer people than the United States. The United States has 350 million people. I think four of them speak English. But um, that is, we have more people in my country than we're on the entire globe at the time of Christ. And if you want to, if you want to take a message to all the Jews, you want this little piece of ground that's about 70 miles wide, about 250 miles long, called Israel. Today, the Jews are everywhere. And there's 8 billion people. So he's going to send 144,000. What are they going to preach? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's got, they've got to preach that again. Um, I'm going to show you something. I like this. I like this. Look at first. I know I'm, I'm being long. Wait a minute. I've only got. <laughs> order, order the pizzas. <laughs> we're going we're to be here for a while. Um, you may not know it, but you are going through the tribulation this morning. <laughs> They're going to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think that's going to be the first three and a half years. Now, I had told you go to Revelation 11, correct? Go to Revelation 11. And believe it or not, uh, I am just about done. Because I can't find this, the next three pages of this, this outline. All right, look what it says, verse uh, 1. And there was given to me a reed uh, like unto a rod, and the angel said, I stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, the holy city, uh, shall they tread underfoot uh, forty and two months. That's three and a half years. Look at verse three. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. You know, one of the problems in your Bible is that the Bible will describe a very great length of time in a verse. All right, how many years in the millennium? A thousand. That millennium is found in uh, Revelation chapter 20, and it starts in verse 3 when the devil is bound and ends in verse 7. A thousand years, and it's four verses in your Bible. Because what's a thousand years to the Lord? It's like a day. Okay. These guys, we, we think about Moses and Elijah being here, but we don't realize they're going to be here for three and a half years. And they're going to be, so the first, now, now some guys think they come in the first half, some guys think the second. You can believe what you want. I believe the first half. Here's what I believe. The rapture happens. We leave. Uh, the Antichrist shows up. He makes that covenant with Israel. Build your temple. I'll be there for the dedication. The two, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, show up in Jerusalem. That's where they, they don't leave Jerusalem. They stay there. So during this first three and a half years, Moses and Elijah are going to be preaching in Jerusalem. For this first three and a half years, the 144,000, who are they going to be? Maybe Jehovah's Witnesses. They're going to be here anyway. <laughs> They're going to be going around the world saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, you may say, oh, it's only to Jews. Well, actually, yes. But I have a question. Now, you know about Moses leading Israel out of Egypt, correct? Was everybody that left with him a Jew? Mm -mm. I don't know if you ever thought about this. 
There had to be Egyptians who put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. They said, hey, it's not to me, but I don't want my kid to die. And they put that up there. And they said to the Jews, when he takes you out, can we go with you? Yeah. So if you were to Jew, if you bought into the gospel of he's going to take us out of Egypt, you got to go too. So I think the first three and a half years, you got Moses and Elijah preaching in, in Jerusalem around the world. You have 144,000 going to the Jews saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And some Gentiles are going to sign on. Now, um, but you, don't, you, don't, you may not, may, well, well, wait, wait, I want to I show you this. I'll look at verse 7. Revelation 11, 7. And then he said, well, uh, when they finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit uh, shall make war against them uh, and shall overcome them and kill them in their dead bodies, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which all, uh, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues uh, and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. And they shall dwell upon uh, the earth uh, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry uh, and shall send gifts one to another because they, the two prophets uh, tormented them. Uh, the tor these two prophets tormented them uh, on the earth. Now watch verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entereth into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. I bet it does. <laughs> Could you imagine being there and all of a sudden Moses' head Goes back on the body, and he gets up and goes, "Oh man, it's stiff! I feel like I've been laying on concrete for three and a half days." <laughs> Watch verse twelve, and they heard. Now, carefully, carefully put these words in your mind. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto, unto them, "Come up hither." And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Wait a minute. When the Lord went up in Acts 10, or Acts 1, did the people see him go up? Moses and Elijah going up, and it says they're going to be, they're going to watch him go into a cloud, right? They heard a voice from heaven. What was it? Come up hither, correct? Okay. Look at look at Revelation chapter 14. There is a rapture in Revelation 14. And it is the only rapture that we can watch this rapture take place. We can watch it happen. Look at uh, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is on this earth. I have stood on Mount Zion. I've been over there. A lamb stood on uh, Mount Zion, and with him in hundred and forty and four thousand. Well, we knew who those guys are. Having their father's name written in their foreheads. So in verse 1, you have Jesus Christ standing on the, on the earth with the hundred and four thousand. Correct? Okay. Look at verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven. Where did you hear those words before? Isn't that exactly what happened in chapter 11? And a great voice from heaven? What did the voice say? Come up hither. So they hear a voice. Wait a minute. They hear a voice from heaven. From heaven. Um, you heard it, right? Where did you hear it? You heard it right where you're at. What if you heard that sound outside the door? You'd be hearing it from over there, correct? Correct. Okay, you hear things from where they are not. Uh, I was uh, I was in Knoxville. Well, I was in Knoxville when I came here, but uh, many years ago, uh, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm standing outside the the church is built on a hill. I'm standing in the parking lot. I'm looking at the two lane highway uh, at the foot of the, of the thing. Now, have you ever heard a car wreck? There are two sounds associated with a car wreck. Right? You hear the brakes, then you hear the impact. Guys, I am standing looking at this highway and I heard a car wreck. But there's no car wreck. Traffic is fine. But I heard, I didn't hear the screech of the brakes, I just heard the metal hit metal from above me. And in about three seconds, a car fell out onto me. No. It's not, it's not quite how it went. I looked up. You know what I saw? I don't know if you know what a Remember a Boeing, oh, an old Boeing 707? It was, a, it was a jet transport. Our military bought those, and they call them a KC-135, and they use them for aerial refueling. Now, in our Air Force, I don't know about the Canadian Air Force, but in our Air Force, during peacetime, planes get damaged. Do you know what the greatest damage to an airplane is? 
in peacetime. Wing damage. Because these guys, they're trying to get as close, they're just jocks, they're, they're proud, and they get as close as they can, and they end, up, they end up hitting wings. We had two F-18s, Navy pilots, practicing a head-on, and neither one of them would turn. And they hit. At the last moment, they hit. One, it knocked the nose off of it and the canopy. The other one, it damaged the wing. They both piloted them down. They both got them down. But that's, that's what they were. I look up. You know what I see? I see two KC-135s, and their flight path is like this. Huh. I think, well, if it's here like this, about three seconds ago, it was right here. Those guys were flying. Big old, it's a great, great big gas tank. And they were getting as close as they could, and they slapped wings. But I heard it from above me. These guys are standing on earth. They hear a voice from heaven. Revelation 11, 11, that was come up here. They watch verse 2. And heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, the voice of great thunder, and heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> and look at verse 3. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. What throne are they before? Well, keep reading the verse. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. They're on the earth in verse 1. They heard a voice, a voice in heaven, uh, from heaven in verse 2. And verse 3, they're standing from the throne. So you get the first half. Now all, 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 all seven years is God raining wrath on the world. But that first three and a half, you got Moses and Elijah preaching in Jerusalem. you got the 144,000 going around the world saying, kingdom of heaven's at hand. And right here in the middle, they hear, come up hither. Who's going up? Well, we know Moses and Elijah going up. We know the 144,000 going up. And probably anybody who bought in. Okay, I believe it. Kingdom's going to happen. They went up. That's when the, the, the Antichrist gets mad at Israel and says, I'm going to kill you all. And the last half is known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's going to happen. And the world can't stop it. Biden can't stop it. Trudeau can't stop it. There's not a, there's not a world. There's not a world leader. Uh, the, the, the WEF. You know what's funny? You know what I think is funny? In my country, when they make a movie and they want a villain, they always give him a German accent. <laughs> we will kill you all. <laughs> <laughs> and we have this Klaus Schwab saying, and by 2030, you will own nothing and be happy. I thought, I saw him in a movie. <laughs> He ought, to, he ought to be saying, well, friends, I'll tell you what, by 2030, you ain't going to know nothing. You ain't going to own nothing. You're going to be happy as a, as a pig in slop. <laughs> this guy's a crow. All he's going to do have here is to put the swastika where it belongs. This is like a Nazi. So what if the World, world Economic Forum says, uh, guys, we met and the Bible has been disengaged. Nothing is going to happen. Would all of you say, Preacher, what are we going to do now? There's not going to be a rapture. There's not going to be a temple built. There's not going to be a tribulation. They can't stop it. I'll give you one last one. I want you to show you a verse. I don't know if you ever saw this verse before. Or if you read it, if it ever, if it ever, if it ever got in. But take a look at Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, there is a verse. It says this in verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, preacher, I saw that. I know. I saw that. First time I saw that verse was June 14, 1970. And I got saved. All right. You say by grace? Ask the Lord to save you. Take the death, the burial, and the resurrection of, of Christ as the full and complete payment for your sin. Ask him in your heart. Ask him to save you. And you got saved. Right? That still works. And the world can't stop it. Uh, some countries, they are going to make anti-conversion laws where you can't win anybody to Christ. But could you imagine if, if you know, the guy that ruling in the White House right now says, uh, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved, but I have declared that's no longer in force. Would that mean you, you, you go out and try soul winning and it doesn't work anymore? <laughs> Nobody can stop that. Let me tell you, I'll give you this, I'll be done. When I was in Bible college, one of the guys in my class Worked as an orderly in a hospital. There was a guy, I, I don't remember his name, let's just say Smith, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith is in a coma, has been in a coma for several months. And he's just kind of 
hovering between life and death. It was it really happened. And and this guy who was in my my class, my graduating class, said when I didn't have anything to do, I would sneak into his room. You know they say when somebody's in a coma, you don't know if they can hear what's going on or not. And he said I'd get down by his ear, and he'd say, "Mr. Smith, Jesus Christ is the Son of God." And he went through the whole gospel. He told about the death, the burial, and resurrection. And he, he didn't know if he's connecting or not. And he did this for quite a while. And he finished his shift one time on Friday. He came back on Monday. And he goes by Mr. Smith's room, and it's empty. Fresh bed. Nobody there. Obviously, Mr. Smith has died. He goes to the nurse's station, and he said, when did Mr. Smith die? She said, what? Mr. Smith, room... 248. When did he die? He didn't die. Boy, yeah, his bed's made. He's gone. Oh, no. Saturday, he came out of the coma. And Sunday, they, they sent him home. He was fine. He left. He's okay now. Now, that's a shock. He said, one year later, he, still working at the hospital, and he looks down the hall, and some guy is coming to visit a friend in the hospital, and it's Mr. Smith. And he says, Hey, hey, excuse me, aren't you? And he said his name. He says, yeah. He says, weren't you in a coma in this hospital? Body? Yeah, I was. I was in for a long time. They thought I was going to die. And, and you came out of the coma and went home. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm fine. He says, can I ask you a question? Yeah. When you were in a coma, I came into your room, and I whispered about Jesus Christ dying for your sins in your ear. I whispered about trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Could you hear me? This guy says, I heard every word, and I got saved in a coma. That, that, that makes there's, there's hope for Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, if you see him, I'm just going to say, Joe, you can be saved. All you got to do is get the... the, the uh, yeah. <laughs> I see you're laughing. He will understand. But guys, you can still go out and win people to Christ. Is this not still true? Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. They can't stop it. You know what I think is sad? You know what I think is sad? I'm not a hunter. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I don't golf. When I do any of those, you find out why they're four-letter words. <laughs> but imagine being a great hunter. And, 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 and you go, look at that rack. I got that. I shot that myself. Yeah, and when the rapture happens, you leave it here. Right? Let me ask you a question this morning. I want two questions. One, are you saved? If you are here this morning, you haven't trusted Christ, death, burial, and resurrection as a complete payment for your sin, you can be saved today. But most of you are saved, right? Now, here's my question. I want you to think about this question. You're going to heaven, true? When you get there, will there be anybody that walks up and hugs your neck and says, thanks for telling me about Jesus Christ. Thanks for leading me to Christ. My friend, will meet Mr. Smith in heaven. And Mr. Smith will hug his neck and say, man, thanks for what you told me when I was in a coma. Is, is there going to be one person that is going to say, I'm saved because of you? You're the guy that brought me, you're the lady that brought me the gospel, you're the guy that brought me the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? Success is not what you hang on your wall or park in your driveway. Success is when you get to heaven and somebody walks up and says, I never heard about Jesus Christ until you told me. And I argued with you for a while, but I finally got on my knees and I trusted Christ. Guys, if you're going to heaven, you know what you want? You want somebody there because of your actions on this earth. That's what you want. I'll tell you this, I'll be done. I pastored a church in Auburn, New York for about five years. I, get, I say I got out of good behavior. And we needed a vacuum cleaner. And I went to a little place, maybe it's maybe uh, not quite this big. If we, if we just went from the wall straight out, it was about that big. A little little one one man shop vacuum cleaner salesman and the guy that ran it was a guy by the name of bob and bob i mean he was sarcastic new yorkers are sarcastic you say what time it is they go what do you care <laughs> you, you just think they want to fight no that's how they are well he was he was sarcastic but he went when he found out i was a preacher he went into afterburner and he came after me now you may not know this but I can be sarcastic. I'm up for it. 
and he is after me, and I'm after him. We're standing in the middle of this little vacuum cleaners building, going after each other. Like two little terrier dogs. So what happened? I bought the cleaner. I don't care if you, I bought his vacuum cleaner. I left. I would come back. He believed some really stupid things. I wouldn't even need anything. Vacuum cleaner's working fine. I didn't need any bags or anything. I'd walk in. And as soon as I walk in, venom would drip. And he'd look at me. He'd go, what do you need to now, preacher? And I'd tell him the truth. I said, Bob, I don't need anything. Vacuum cleaner's working fine. Then why are you here? I just want to see what new stupid thing you believe. You see, he didn't say, I sure did, because he believed some stupid stuff. I want to see what he's adding to the repertoire. I said, I want to see what new stupid thing you believe. And blah, 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 we're going back at it. Blah, 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 blah. So what happened? I won. Bob got saved. He told me years later, there were two independent Baptist churches in town. And the pastor of the other church was a big old big guy, burly, six, hundred, six foot something. That's like uh, 84 kilometers. And... Um, <laughs> And when he, he went in for a vacuum cleaner, too. And he said, when that guy walked in my shop, I thought, oh, man, I'm in trouble. And he goes like this, cream puff. He said, I chewed him up and spit him out. He said, this is exact words. And then God sent me Sam Gipp. Bob got saved. We left in 1986 to go back in evangelism. And I'll never forget, when, when Bob got saved, he was divorced. His wife got saved. They got remarried. His son and daughter. Two teenage son and daughter. They got saved. Bob got baptized into an, and got in an independent baptist. He lived in a, in a town 50 miles away, and there was a good church in his hometown, and he got active. He not only did that, he got him a nursing home ministry. And the first, the first Christmas we were gone, he sent his Christmas card. And he says, uh, here's what uh, here's what I've been doing. He was telling about him and how happy him and his wife are, uh, how his son his son and daughter are doing. Told us about. He says, and he said uh, the pastor preached today. Today it was Sunday, and it was great. But the biggest thing was when I got to go to the nursing home and preach the gospel. And then he was done. But he wrote one more sentence before he signed it. He put one more sentence in there. You know what he said? He said, "And thanks for winning me to Christ." My goodness. Will you ever hear those words? You're going to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? But when you get there, will anybody say, thanks for winning me to Christ? Isn't somebody going to hug your neck and say, I wouldn't be here if you had knocked on my door? I wouldn't be here if you didn't come, keep coming back when I told you to get out of here? Is anybody going to be there to say, thank you for winning me to Christ? And if you're saved, you know I don't understand? I don't understand And, and I know you guys, I know, I know this is not your building. But I don't understand. People come to church and they walk past the track rack and never grab them. Then they walk out and never grab them. And they're free. And then that week they go, I was talking to somebody about the Lord. I needed a track. I wish I had one. Well, who are you going to blame? I tell people, put these everywhere. Put them everywhere. Put them everywhere you can. You don't have to pay. If you look, I'm going to tell you something, guys. I, I teach preaching. And you know what I tell my young preachers? There is a great truth to preaching. If you know this one truth about preaching, you can be a great preacher. Anybody here, I can make anybody a great preacher if you know this one truth. And here it is. When we speak, we hope the Holy Spirit taps you on the heart and says, you know he's right. You need to take care of that. That's called conviction. You understand? Ever been there conviction? Okay. What if I can't get, get you to conviction? Then I make you feel guilty. So the great truth of preaching is, in lieu of conviction, intimidation will work. So what do you mean? I make you feel guilty about something, and you think you're in a conviction. I'll show you how this works. I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you all not convicted. I'm going to guilt trip all of you. Question. Do you want the lost people in your area to get saved and go to heaven? Okay, I got you. And how many of you... Witness to a hundred people in your town last week. I didn't witness to a hundred people in my town. You don't really care about souls. I don't really care about souls. <laughs> That's not conviction. I'm going to tell you this. If you don't pass tracks, I'm supposed to say, oh, you're, you're scared, you're a coward, you hate people, you don't care if they go to hell. I don't think that's it at all. 
I think some of you are intimidated by walking up to somebody and saying, can I give you this? Do you know what I tell you? you heard, I'm gonna give you, do you have a track rack anywhere around here? Okay, grab five. That's not even one per day. And between this Sunday and next Sunday, I'm not even tell you to hand one to a human being. But ask God, where can I leave these? That somebody will find them. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not a farmer. But if I went across your country or mine from coast to coast, and every time I saw an empty field, I threw some handfuls of seed corn. First question, would it all come up? No. Second question, would it all not come up? Did you ever, did you ever see a, a, like a, a, a field of uh, canola and there's a, ro a rogue stalk of corn sticking up in it? That's one of my tracks. <laughs> put them out. But if, you don't put, if I don't put any seed out, nothing grows. The man who attempts nothing is always successful. Do you want to be that person? He said, well, I'm afraid to talk to people. Then ask God where you can put them. I can tell you where you can put them right now. This will be the best place in the world, and it's everywhere in your town. The track delivery slot on a car. Say, where's the track delivery slot? The guy has gone into a restaurant. Is it a little warm out here? You know it's like what, 33 degrees? Water freezes at 33 degrees. What is wrong with you people? Anyway. <laughs> or 32. Anyway. So the guy's got to go into a restaurant, and he so wants a Christian to come by and have him a gospel track. But he has to go in the restaurant. So just for you, he leaves his window down that much. So that you can put a track in it. That is, you understand that's why he left his window down. Do you know how sad he's going to be if he comes back to his car and goes, oh, no, he left me a track. But would it be something? You put a track in there. Let me ask you a question. You going to heaven? Come on, you going to heaven? And you get up there, you talk to some guy. And you say, uh, how'd you get saved? Oh, you're not going to believe it. I was in Edmonton, Canada. And I went into a restaurant, left my window down that much. When I came out, somebody had tossed one of these on my seat. And I read it and I got saved. Put them out. You want somebody to get saved. I want you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Guys, there's going to be the rapture, the blessed hope, and the world can't stop it. They're going to rebuild the third temple, and the world can't stop it. There's going to be a one world dictatorship. The world can't stop it. There's going to be a worldwide tri uh, tribulation. The world cannot stop it. And anybody, whosoever shall call upon in the Lord, shall be saved. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I have two questions. Number one, is there anybody here? By an uplifted hand. You don't have to be afraid. I'm not going to point you out or give any pressure to you. Is there anybody who would say, I do not know for a fact that if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to. Here's my hand to acknowledge that. Anybody like that? Okay, I kind of figured that. How many people would say this, preacher? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved, but I don't know when I get to heaven if I'm going to have even one person there that is there because I led him to Christ. I've never led a soul to Christ. Here's my hand. I'm not going to embarrass you, honest. I've never led a soul to Christ. Here's my hand to acknowledge that. Would you put your hand up right now? All right. I'm going to pray for you. Could you put them down? I'm going to pray for you. I'm, guys, I am not going to call you names. I am not going to intimidate you. I'm not going to guilt trip you. But I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that God gives you a soul. You know what you can do if you just raise your hand? I know it sounds crazy. Ask God for an easy one. I hadn't led a soul to Christ for a while. I said, Lord, give me an easy one. And, and, and this kid, I led this little kid to the Lord. Almost a couple of weeks later. I said, well, that's an easy one. Ask God for an easy one. Grab some tracks and put them out. Be determined that when you get to heaven, someone will be there to hug your neck and say thanks for winning me to Christ. The antlers won't matter. How many grandchildren you got won't matter. How much you made every week won't matter. Who's in heaven because of you? I'm going to pray. The piano will play. If you need to talk to the Lord, that's what church is for. You're here to be edified. You're here to be exhorted. You're here to be made perfect in the Lord. Not sinless, but perfect. Maybe this morning you need to say, Lord, maybe there's somebody here and you haven't been somebody Christ, but it's been a long time. Maybe you need to get back on the horse. Get back out there. 
get back out there, start knocking on doors again and say, Lord, I need to get somebody saved. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. I am here because of Jesus Christ. And he didn't even come here for me, he came here for the Jews. I am not glad that the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. But I'm certainly thankful that when they did, you had a divine plan B for him to go to the Gentiles. And here we are. And we are rejoicing. We sing, God. You heard us. We sing about what your son did for us. No one raised their hand here that they were lost. If there's a lost person here, please touch their heart, Father, because they need to be saved. Horrible thing, God, to go to hell from church. But some hands went up of people who've never won anybody to Christ. They're saved. And there's probably people here that are saved and have won somebody to Christ, but it's been a long time. I want to pray for these people. I'm not going to put them down, God. They're good people. They, they, I, they're here in church. They have stayed here a long time because I preached so long. I'm so sorry. But give them an easy one. Help them. Help them get some gospel tracks and put them out. They don't have to talk to another human. Find some way they can put those tracks out. God, I pray for the people that raise their hand who have never won a soul to Christ. I pray they win one before you come back. And for those who have, but they haven't won anybody for quite a while, I pray, God, you speak to their heart, and they get back in the saddle, and they get back winning people to Christ so that when they get to heaven, how many here, God, when they step into heaven, will have anybody hug their neck and say, thanks, I'm here because of you. So that is the, the invitation today, God, that your people would be determined to serve you and win people to Christ until he gets here. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the piano plays, if you need to talk to the Lord, now's the time. Uh, if you want to come up here and kneel, that's what you do. If you want to kneel at your chair, sit down, wherever the case is. Lord, I've never won a soul to Christ. I want to win a soul to Christ. Lord, I haven't won a soul for a long time. I want somebody. I need to get back out there. I need to beat the bushes. I need to pass out some tracks. God, help me get some gospel tracks and bless them as I put them out. God, when I get to heaven, I want somebody to hug my neck and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here because of you. for what we've heard. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us, Lord, in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.